Folks, welcome back to the Catholic Coaching Podcast. Got a really exciting interview te uh, teed up today uh, with one of our growing mentors that we have, Dr. Kevin Vost. Uh, you can see him here if you're watching already. He's already on, on screen. Uh, but a little bit about Dr. Vost. We've got a lot of books. These are two. Some of the ones we have are on Kindle, so we can't really show them. But two of our favorite books right now that we're diving into are spiritual reading. Uh, all on Aquinas, uh, but he has quite a, a, an extensive background mm -hmm. uh, prior to his reversion to the faith, uh, where for a, a good portion of his life, he was really uh, an, an, a self-proclaimed atheist, uh, delving deeply into some of the, um, some of the, what, how do you call them? The Stoics, the, the, Stoics, the, right? the pagan Stoic yes. philosophers. Mm -hmm. uh, and eventually it was it was uh, Aquinas that led him back to the faith. Uh, he tells a story. He shared a story on EWTN. Uh, he's spoken uh, in numerous different places. He's still on the speaker circuit right now. You can find him uh, anywhere they're talking about Aquinas. He's popping up nowadays. Um, yeah. He's got, uh, he was, I think he's on his 20th book, or maybe maybe he's lost count. Yeah. We'll let him put in there, yeah. but, but lots of books. A bodybuilder. A bodybuilder, which is kind of cool I'm yeah really interested really in cool <laughs> philosopher and also obtained his doctor of psychology in clinical psychology and so that's really cool i i think being mindset coaches i remember i was making these connections with the stoics with cognitive behavioral therapy and aquinas and then i found dr vos books and i said oh he made these connections first that's amazing like okay yes I have to read all of his stuff. So we, we made him an unofficial co-founder of Metanoia <laughs> Catholic at that point. Yes. Uh, yeah. So we're going to be talking all things. We're also going to be talking about loneliness because he wrote a book on that too, Catholic Guide to Lon Loneliness. And so really excited to have you on, Dr. Vost. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> My pleasure to be here. And please feel free to call me Kevin. Awesome. Awesome, Kevin. Cool. Cool. Let's kind of dive right into it. I, I know yeah. we reached out. We had a conversation a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Just, uh, just really, we were just so excited. And thank you for for uh, taking the time and then scheduling a more formal time here. Uh, but a little bit on going back to the the loneliness book, right? The Catholic Guide to Loneliness. Mm -hmm. I think one of the first questions that we have is is um, really what inspired you to write this book? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a good question because uh, I think at this point, the answer about the tally, I think there. are 20 Catholic books out there and five more in various stages right now. And of those books, the majority of them, you know, I had an idea and I proposed it to publishers, but some of them publishers, you know, approached me. And this book on loneliness is one where Charlie McKinney, the publisher of Sophia Institute Press approached me. And it must've been probably in uh, uh, 2016, I believe, uh, and, and asked if I would consider doing a book on this topic. Uh, they'd had a previously published a wonderful book called The Catholic Guide to Depression by a psychiatrist and a priest. It was very, very well received. And they'd become aware of this growing uh, epidemic of loneliness. Now, uh, part of the reason they asked me is my background in clinical psychology. Uh, though I focus more on things like Alzheimer's disease, brain disorders, or the neuropsychology. Uh, but it did intrigue me. So when they asked me, I thought, well, this is very, very interesting. So it drove me back into the psychological uh, research. And, and I didn't, you know, even though I had a background in psychology, I did not realize that researchers were talking about a growing epidemic worldwide of loneliness. And they were starting to talk about this, uh, you know, even 2010, even before. So I was so intrigued by it. I thought, yes, I definitely want to write about this topic. I had no idea how prevalent it was and how important it was. So I did do that and researched all through 2016 and in some of 2017. So then I tried to produce a book that I, I said it employed both a small C and a capital C Catholic approach. And by small C, I meant Catholic just means universal, you know, everything. So I want to uncover, I want to look at the psychological, social aspects of loneliness, the secular scientific literature, but I also want to tap into the big C, our Catholic, our Roman Catholic wisdom, and what that can teach us about loneliness. So that was my goal as I worked on this book. But again, it was not my own idea, but thankfully it was an idea that was suggested to me by Sophia Institute Press. 
I love that about your books too. I, I want to add this in. I, I love how um, you synthesize even like I, I've read books that talk about Aquinas. And I think a lot of times they're more complicated than even the Summa. <laughs> but I love how you simp- synthesize it and simplify something that's that can become very um, complex. And so another plug for all of your books out there, if anybody's interested in learning about Aquinas and how it applies to just your daily life, like how you could you as a lay Catholic can apply these truths to your life. Um, check out Dr. Uh, Vos book or Kevin's books. <laughs> yeah. So you wrote it back in 20 uh, or was published back in 2017. Mm-hmm. And a lot has happened since then. And so in terms of just the relevance, have you seen an, a new relevance for this book, for this guide on mm-hmm. Catholic loneliness here in a post pandemic or who knows if we're posted, but, but the current environment here in 2021. Oh, absolutely. So much has changed since that book came out. You know, in fact, when I went through the research, they talk about global uh, uh, epidemics. I don't even recall the word pandemic being used for loneliness at that time. And of course, none of us had heard of the word COVID uh, or, or any of this, you know, when this book came out. So since that time, uh, you know, though there, were, there was already a growing concern about increases in loneliness. And some of the researchers said the way it's increased, and we may have like a true epidemic by the year 2030, just like the vast majority of people may walk around feeling lonely. So, of course, that is before COVID hit, where we were, you know, encouraged to practice social isolation or isolation, you know, maybe perhaps better described as a physical uh, distancing than social distancing, because we want to keep social contact, ideally, though we may need to physically uh, distance. Uh, you know, some people were you know, shut down, locked in, no longer going around coworkers. We had people who could no longer, you know, visit their elderly parents, perhaps in the nursing home. And of course, the, those parents or relatives in the nursing home can't have the visitation. So all kinds of concerns about loneliness started to, to even skyrocket even more than before during COVID. Now, and, and what are the impacts? Well, uh, again, you know, I write about many different topics. So I, just today, I wanted to brush up and do a quick search on some of the most recent research on loneliness. Mm -hmm. And I find there are a bevy of studies out there now addressing just what impact has there been with COVID on loneliness. And some of these are done in particular studies, uh, I'm sorry, in particular different countries like in in Europe. And I happened across one study this morning that had kind of an intriguing finding. And this was a study done in Norway. And they found that some of the people who felt particularly isolated uh, before COVID in, in some sense, may felt slightly less isolated. Hmm. And the reason being that researchers said was, at first it kind of felt like they were all alone here on this lonely person isolated. Well, now it's kind of the norm, hmm. you know? So maybe I don't stand out so much because there is also the sense of, of stigma with loneliness. I know one great researcher said he used to give talks on loneliness to, to live audiences. And he, he'd ask who here in the audience has, has uh, been lonely at some point in your life and everybody raised their hand. You know, yeah, yeah, one point. He says, who's lonely right now? And he said, no one ever raised their hand because there's Mm -hmm. a kind of a stigma. Oh, if you're lonely, what's wrong with you? Why don't you have friends? Have you alienated people? You know, Mm -hmm. so anyway, it's very, very complex. But but my take is we've gone through the stages of COVID with the various mandates and lockdowns, even, you know, masking so we can't see people's facial expressions like we used to. My hope through this has been that it will bring loneliness more to the forefronts of our minds, even those of us, you know, who are not lonely, to be aware so many people out there are. And those little things that you can do to reach out to them can make a vast difference in your life. So anyway, I, I hope this is one of the positive outcomes of what we've been through the last few years, is mm-hmm. it will heighten our awareness of the fact of loneliness and uh, how important it is that we, especially as Catholics, you know, we're supposed to love our neighbors as ourselves. How important it is. It is for us to be aware for these people to look out for them and, and to reach out, reach out to them. Mm. Uh, you know, something that you were saying reminded me of that line from the piano man. Uh, they're sharing a drink they call loneliness, but it's better than drinking alone. <laughs> you know, that it's, yes. it, that's kind of what's happening. That's a fascinating study. That's a fascinating yeah. data point that comes out where people are at least finding some camaraderie in the loneliness or a lifting of the stigma. Yeah, exactly. That's one thing I statement, a brief sentence I put in the book. I put, you know, if you are lonely, you are not alone. 
you know, yeah. which is kind of the irony of it too, right? Yes. So that was also part of the theme I tried to get in that book is, you know, one way, especially as Catholics, one way we might be able to alleviate our own loneliness is to be aware of the other lonely people around us and to do something to try to heal them, to try to help them. You know, thereby we're, we're both going to be lifted out of uh, mm. uh, loneliness. Yeah, there's, there's something of that looking outside of, of oneself that's yeah. that's a big part, I imagine, of the uh, of, of countering loneliness. But if we can get put like a good solid definition on loneliness, mm -hmm. how would you define it? Sure. You know, most of the, you know, social scientists, clinicians that talk about it have various classifications, but one I really like talked about two basic forms of, of, of loneliness, the most common. And, and one was called uh, a perceived emotional isolation. It's so mm -hmm. like a perceived isolation, but this is at an emotional or intimate level. And this would mean that you feel like you don't really have close confidence. You don't have people you can share you know, you're open your heart to. So there's that, that intimacy is lacking. You wish you had that close confidant uh, and you don't. Uh, and I will say regarding that kind of emotional, like not having a one-on-one, -on -one, a really close friend, a loving spouse, uh, a parent who, you're, who you have a deep bond to, a sibling. If you lack that, it's, it's such, a, such a devastating thing. Mm. Uh, but as I did the research, I found a fascinating study was done at University of Chicago. It was from about 1985, and they followed up 25 years later. And they asked a group of thousands of people about their confidants. Like, who do you confide in when you have something serious to talk about? You know, and who are they? Are they your coworkers? Are they your siblings? Are they your parents? Are they your neighbors? Are they your parishioners? You know, and they asked them, like, well, how many do you have? How many close confidants do you have? And they gave them a choice of zero, one, two, three, four, five, or six or more. Mm -hmm. And in 1985, the modal number, most people said, I got about three people who were close to me. 20 years later, that was down uh, to two people as hmm. the average. And, but here's the most dramatic finding. Back in 1985, one person in 10 said zero. I don't really have anybody I can turn to. Mm -hmm. So the mid-1980s, 10% of the population, no, no close confidants. But 20 years later, that had risen to a quarter, like one person in four said so they had really no close person to confide in. So, I mean, that kind of shows this, the importance of this phenomenon at the level of emotional isolation. Mm. But kind of a second level, a little bit broader level, is a broader perceived uh, social isolation. This might be, well, let's say you do have a loving spouse, or you have a good family relationship, or you have a few close friends, but, but let's say you don't feel like you fit in in your work environment, or you feel out of place in your parish, or maybe you just moved across the country, you don't know anybody, you're finding it hard to make new friends. So you, while you might have some of those very important intimate bonds, you don't feel you fit in a, in a broader way, it's a form of a broader group uh, or community. So those are two key dimensions, an emotional, intimate isolation, sense of isolation, or a social, broader sense of isolation, or, or some combination of both. But kind of a key factor there too, is that it's your perception of perceived isolation, saying that the intimacy I do have, the connectedness I do have, is not what I want it to be. It falls mm. short. Mm. And, and that, too, we must point out, what can vary between people. You know, some people are more introverted and just that one or two close confidants, and they're doing all right. Other mm. people feel a need for, for a broader sense of connectedness. So in that sense, it's individualized. It's personalized. Uh, so it's perceived. It's your own perception. But it can, of course, have, have very, very close ties. To reality, a person with one close confidant, that confidant may have just passed away, you know, mm -hmm. so, so there's a lot to, to uh, loneliness, but it's, I think it's helpfully characterized at those two fundamental levels, the real intimate and the somewhat broader social. Yeah, so you said something, every time I see that word perceived or perception, it's, mm -hmm. uh, my mind immediately goes to the thought in your head. You know, the, um, the judgment that mm -hmm. you've made, this is good or bad. Um, and it, it kind of brings me to my next question. And you answered this a little bit, but it's a, it's a nuance on the question, which is what do you think is the cause of loneliness in most people? Sure, sure. And I'll kind of answer it kind of at uh, two different levels, an external level on the outside world and an internal level within us because they, they tend to interact. You know, there can be all kinds of, of triggers of loneliness, maybe of a person who wasn't lonely before. And classic examples would be the loss of a loved one, you know, 
or, or relocating across the country, or for a child whose best friend moves away, or, or they're, they're bullied, or they're just that, you know, so there's all things can trigger it, things that happen in our lives. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of, you know, kind of what it does inside us, uh, one of the fundamental causes there are, yeah, is the fact that, okay, now we're perceiving, hey, you know, I'm, I'm not connected. And at a positive level, you know, researchers have compared this sense, this perception, wait a minute, things aren't as they should be. It can be a positive sign. They compared it to both uh, pain and thirst, right? You know, we, we, it's good for us to be connected to others. You know, God, you know, man was not made to, to be alone. So if we feel lonely, it can be a positive prompt. Hey, there's something missing here. We need to, we need to reach out. We need to try to make these connections. So if we think of it in terms of a, a pain or a thirst response, that's good, you know, if it, if it prompts us to do something. But in some people, you know, if they're lonely for a long time, if they're hesitant to, to reach out or if they reach out and it's unsuccessful, then the perception itself can become distorted. Some of the research talks about a problem in some lonely people, if it's lasted a long time, is what they call just maladaptive uh, social cognition mm -hmm. or kind of inappropriate perceptions about the way you're going to relate to others. So in, in people who are profoundly lonely, this can be an increased expectation that if they're going to reach out to people, nobody's going to care or they're going to be uh, rejected or the little things that do happen in their life that are fairly innocent, they might interpret it as a rejection when they've not really been rejected. And it can even impact th their memories. When they think about different social interactions, they might look back on the bad times when they've been rejected or snubbed or when a loved one has, has uh, let them down. So your whole way of thinking kind of becomes distorted and you're less likely to think clearly and remember all the, the positives when you've had the, the positive interactions uh, uh, with others. Hmm. That's interesting. A lot of what you're saying too makes me think of how now we have COVID that just happened and is still kind of happening, but then also the added um, thing of social media where what you were saying, it's a perceived emotional closeness or support mm -hmm. or lack of, sorry, it's a perceived lack of emotional support. Right. Um, how, how have you seen social media add into the loneliness factor? Yeah, that, you know, definitely when I was doing my research too, a lot of the research, you know, looked into that. And interestingly, at that social level, there was a book called Bowling Alone that came out in the year 2000. And it was showing that people were less socially interconnected, less, well, less likely to be, part of the reason you call it a bowling alone, they're less likely to belong to bowling leagues. They were just going out on their own. Like when I was a kid, way back in the 60s and 70s, that was a very popular thing. But in many dimensions, people were less likely to, to join different organizations, whether they're political or community or sports-based. You know, people were more likely to go it on their own. Or even notice, even in bowling leagues, people, even on teams still, would often sit and watch TV screens when it wasn't their turn instead of interacting with, with others. So in part of his research, he found that part of this lack of the broader social connections that was documented in America, he traced a lot of it actually to the growth of television mm -hmm. uh, and, and increasing numbers of hours watching television meant less social activity. The increased number of television sets within a single house was correlated with less activity, so on. Mm -hmm. But anyway, at the end of his book, he's writing this in, in 2000 or it comes out in 2000, he's saying, well, kind of what we need to watch for now, there's this new thing out there called the internet right? And I'm not sure if he even mentioned social media at that time. I don't remember when that really became popular. But, but anyway, so now, now, especially in the last 20 years or so, we have the whole phenomenon of the internet and social uh, media. Uh, and I think that has a large impact at the social level, but also that individual emotional level. And, and certainly to some extent, it's a mixed bag. There are absolutely potential positives there through Facebook. Or, or through like the COVID times, you're not allowed to see a person face to face, but hey, now I can pull grandma up on the screen. You know, at least we can see each other's facial expressions. There's very, very many, you know, potential positives with the social, social media and our ability to connect with each other, but also certainly some negatives there. The fact that it becomes so addicting the use of social media, the, the checking of the cell phone behaviors. There's been some research on how often people do this and it amounts to like thousands of times over a month, all this just 
checking. And we're at risk when we're doing that. Uh, you know, we might be spending excessive times looking at social media when our house might be full of actual real life friends and relatives, you know, out there and we're taking time away from, from mm. them. So my, my typical advice with social media is I don't say, I don't, personally, I, don't, I, I use it somewhat myself, but maybe set a timer there and keep that in mind. Am I ignoring some, am I ignoring my wife, you know, because I've just realized, oh, wow, I've been two years, two hours now looking at people's dogs and cats on <laughs> Facebook, you know, maybe I should go pay attention to, to our own dog. Oh, that's great. I was, I'm thinking just more of an anecdote, but a, a friend of mine actually said that, uh, you know, he's got teenage kids and he said, I, I've been thinking about writing this book called The Vanishing. And it's all about how our neighborhood used to be so full of these kids that would come and they'd play. Our house was, they were just going in and out of everybody's house. They were all over the neighborhood. You know, the streetlights come on, they come back in. And one by one, when a kid got a cell phone, all of a sudden they just would stop showing up. Mm. They would just disappear. And he said, I could almost just diagnose it down to the, to the kid. Like as soon as they got a cell phone, they just started to disappear. Mm. And uh, you, you think about it, there's a thought, there's a perception here, always choosing what we believe to be in keeping with our greatest good, right? There's a perception that this is better than the actual interaction that's there. And, mm. and uh, I, I, can, I can imagine certainly that, you know, just from looking at my own life, that there's a you could say, okay, what are the positives of hiding behind social media or using social media in lieu of an actual relationship? Well, we could probably even compare it to what are the positives of using pornography instead of actually entering into a marital intimacy mm -hmm. in an intimate personal relationship with somebody else. Uh, there's, there's no vulnerability really mm. at that point. You yeah. know, you, you, there's, you, you, can sh you can show yourself how you'd like to be seen, right? And there's always that thought of, well, if the other person sees me for who I actually am, maybe then they will reject me and then I truly will be lonely. And so we could see mm -hmm. just the way that Satan mm -hmm. can kind of weave his way into this. Yeah. Um, or even the, the, a lot of these video games right now, uh, you see young men on these video games, mostly young men, but there's a social aspect of it there. You can chat in, you can type with people, you can be on a team and, and, mm -hmm. you know, attacking a position or something like that mm -hmm. uh, through these, through these uh, online video games. But there's still something when you talk to these men, there's still something that's lacking. And there's a lack of depth. Right? Yeah. That's there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The lack of depth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I hope your friend does write that book and I love the potential title. And if he wants a reviewer or endorsement, let me know because <laughs> you bet. I, I see that too. In fact, Sometimes, you know, not only in our old neighborhood, which I'm, I'm kind of, my wife and I are back to the house that I grew up in. It was away from our family for years and we're here. So we have some younger people and, and some older people who are original, but, but it's always a special joy to us when we see kids out playing. Mm -hmm. It's like, we're the old enough people to say, hey, when we were young, we spent all summer outside. We just came home when we got hungry or needed to drink out of the hose or something, you know. <laughs> but, uh, but now we'll even drive around town. I was like, look, kids are out there riding their bikes. Look. Kids are out there playing baseball and like, yay, you know. That's what it was like when we went to Ave Maria. We just fell in love with because they had kids out skateboarding and riding bikes and time. just like there's just playing basketball. The kids all over the place. And it's amazing. It's just there's something about you look at a neighborhood like that and you're like, this is a neighborhood that's alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, the cell phone thing, I mean, like talk about yeah, extremely sharp two-edged sword. And another phenomenon with, with the cell phones, not that I'd be totally against them, I, I you know, use one myself, but is that they found too, like with, with children, and you talked about too, I think, Matt, some kids like they're worried, well, if somebody gets to know me real well, then they're not going to like me. I know they documented a, a phenomenon with the cell phones that even phone, actual phone calls decreased to be replaced by text. So another step away from face-to-face -face interaction to seeing you to speaking to each other, at least hearing each other's voices, to purely uh, written communication, you know, kind of getting farther and farther mm -hmm. away from that true human connection. So that's something we really do need to, to wake up to and, and, uh, and do something about. And, and probably, you know, this is almost, this is an overused uh, example, but I think it's a real one probably everyone can relate to. But I, but I do think people are getting more aware of this now. I do happen to think I see a little bit less was a classic phenomenon of a family seated around a dinner table 
at their home or with other guests or at a restaurant, and they're all faced facing into these screens. So I think that's something we definitely need to mm -hmm. discourage, at least when there are the limited times when, when families and friends can get together, that ideally you'll turn off those electronics mm -hmm. and enjoy each other's you know, actual presence, you know, at least for, for an hour or two. Yeah. Yeah. And it may even be uncomfortable if you're not used to doing it. Yeah. Like it may, don't expect it to be easy right off the bat. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was something we've kind of gone through it through a transition recently where we, with our three-year-old, now we sit at the dinner table and, mm -hmm. and we have our meals there. And, and, uh, and even Aaron and I, we have to, we have to shut off our, 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 because we're business partners here and mm -hmm. at the same time in marriage as well. And, and we want to talk business sometimes. And we can see when our daughter is just like, no, like I, I want to be seen. I want to be, yes. I want I, see me, look at me. Mm -hmm. And then it's so funny, always funny too. And as soon as you look at her and then she just kind of goes, I don't know what to do with all this attention now. She gets oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Which I think we can all relate to as adults too. When somebody finally does see you, you're like, please. When you're whoa. seen. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. There's something so beautiful about being seen and, and the beatific vision, right? It's seeing God face to face. Yeah, exactly. And that being seen too, in the loneliness book, when I try to give simple things, well, what can we do to reach out to lonely? I have a last trip, like 30 simple things. I mean, and they can be as simple as smile. You're in an elevator with a person. Instead of staring away, smile at them. Say hi, you know, mm -hmm. especially the person who's profoundly lonely. If they're going throughout their whole day around people who act as if they don't even exist, you know, that's, that's not very encouraging. So we can do those smallest things to let people know they're seen. Even if it's done nothing but a smile or a nod, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it, it can make a real difference to total strangers. And then even in our family, yeah, like you say, we need to be careful that well, of course, my kids, my spouse, they know I love them, you know, but we do still need to make those little signs. When they come in the door, you hear them say hi. Don't just, oh, well, big deal. I'm, I'm on Facebook. Maybe they won't come bother me <laughs> for a while. There yeah. was one of the things that you brought up. I think it was on an interview. I'm sorry, cutting you off here, Aaron, but, but uh, <laughs> she's like, and she's tapping me under the, under the table oh, here. Yeah. But I, I think it was an interview that you had where you mentioned the, uh, the corporal work of mercy uh, or of, of visiting the sick might have been you, but it was don't fix the sick problem. Don't don't talk to talk with the sick. It's just visit with the sick. Just be with them. And that was something that we recently went down. We, we spent time with my 98 year old grandmother and uh, she doesn't talk as much anymore. But I, I recognize it's like, you know what, just sitting with her. Mm -hmm. Just being with her mm -hmm. is something that she just enjoys so much. And I think oftentimes even reaching out to those lonely people, there's this thought of like, oh man, well, I'm going to, what are we going to talk about? Or, or what's the, you know, am I going to have to fix their problem? What, and it's just like, no, like just mm -hmm. be with them, just visit with them. That's it. Oh yeah. That's a beautiful, extremely important point. Yeah, it is. You know, it's one of the corporal works of mercy that church teaches. That's how, and Thomas, you know, Aquinas says that these mercy, that's the way charity, that's the way love is enacted towards mm -hmm. other. And, and even some of those ancient Stoics had some beautiful insights on this. Uh, Seneca said that uh, the philosopher Epicurus said that we should have friends. So we'll have somebody to take care of us, you know, when we're sick. And Seneca says, no, get friends. So you have someone to go take care of when they're sick. You know, so that mm. same sort of concept there. Yeah, and you may not be able to heal them. You may not have anything exciting, interesting to say to them, but your very presence can make all the difference in the world. So that, that's a beautiful, beautiful point. Mm. Yeah. So a couple of things that you say in your book, which I was like jumping up and down for joy. It was like, right when you, <laughs> when you open up your book and it talks about cognitive behavioral, like that trajectory, you talk about, Yes, you could be not with somebody presently, but it's still your thoughts that have a lot of impact on whether or not you feel lonely. I'm kind of taking that out of context right now, but that's what you open up with. And then you go into talking about the virtues, which was like, yay. Like I got so excited about that too. Um, and besides could you talk a little bit more about how our thoughts can actually impact if we feel lonely or not? Yes, yes, absolutely. And this ties into some of my favorite things too, the CBT, the cognitive therapies, the stoic philosophy, the insights from the church through people like 
uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. And there's an old statement from, from the philosopher Epictetus. He said, people are disturbed not by things, but by the views they take of things or their beliefs or the judgments or the way they interpret it. So in terms of loneliness, you could have a person without a lot of context, maybe an older person, and, and her beloved spouse of 60 years dies. You know, There's an objective reason for her to realize there is that perceived emotional isolation, and it's real. Uh, their most important confidant is now gone. So there is a true basis for her to feel lonely. I don't have what I did before. But to what extent is she going to feel that loneliness? And is she going to allow it to incapacitate her? Mm. Or is it going to allow her to think, you know, well, my husband certainly doesn't want me to live the rest of my life sad. He's going to want me to find joy. So I'm going to go out there and do that. So your interpretation of the situation is extremely important, and in some ways more important than the situation itself. So that's one of the fundamentals of the the stoic approach, the cognitive therapy approach to, to loneliness. And even as I did review the, the modern research literature on the treatment of loneliness and the psychological, psychiatric literature, they talked about three major classes of interventions. And one was like the su supplying social support groups and things. So a person would have a person to turn to, which of course makes sense and we want that. Another category of interventions was like social skills training. We want the lonely to reach out to others. So let's make sure they know how to initiate a conversation, how to make eye contact, you know, make give a firm handshake, things like this. So that's out there. But the researcher said, but you know, most people who are lonely, they already have these social skills. They, they already know how to interact appropriately. Uh, they have had, they're, they're connected in some ways. They have access to some groups, you know, in their, in their parish or their office or, or wherever. But the main thing tended to be that their social cognition kind of got warped. You know, they're, they're become downcast about, they're expecting rejection, the kind of thing that we talked about before. So that's where this cognitive therapy approach can come in so importantly, changing the way you perceive things. So for example, you might say, you know, oh, I'm going to reach out to, to Betty at the office and see if she wants to go to lunch with me. And then, then the lady, you know, asks Betty and Betty, no, she's not interested. She doesn't go, you know. So, so are you going to be devastated by that? Oh, now I'm even worse off than I was. Or are you going to say, you know, that's unfortunate. I wish she would have gone, but that's not going to keep me from asking somebody else. And maybe there's something going on with her. I'll, I'll pray for, for Betty, or maybe I'll try her another time. So again, it's so important. It's training ourselves to to alter the way we look at situations, to interpret them. And to bear in mind that, you know, even if we may have legitimate reasons to feel lonely, it is up to us whether it devastates us or not. And as Catholics, we know that, you know, some trials that come our way make us all the stronger mm -hmm. through having endured them. And this is one thing I think that can really come with people who experience severe loneliness. It can make them ideally more compassionate with the lonely, more, more cognizant. That person is showing signs uh, of loneliness so maybe they'll they'll reach out now, i'll give you one quick story before i'll, I'll shut up for now but uh blessed pier giorgio frasati mm, okay. uh, a late dominican you know a young man who died in his 20s remember one thing people used to say about him and this was a strapping physically handsome young man born to a super wealthy uh prominent family very very athletic but, but he just loved people. And they said that when he would go to a group, some kind of social gathering, so he kind of look around the room and see who seemed to be isolated or maybe sad or lonely. Mm -hmm. He said, that's who he'd zoom in on and go and, and start a conversation and, and, and share your attention. So I think, you know, ideally, uh, even within the lonely, if we can do that, if we can say, maybe my loneliness will be best served if I recognize it in others and try to, to, to help them lift it. Because that's, the, that's a Christian way, you know, mm -hmm. to lift others as Christ lifts us. Yeah, it's almost like a form of redemptive suffering because you've experienced it, you know, the pain of it. And then you're like, okay, so this, this suffering could be fruitful. I, I, or I could, I could indulge in the suffering and just stay in it, or the suffering can be fruitful. And really what indicates that is what I choose to think about it. One of my favorite questions to ask my coaching clients is what are you making that mean? So mm -hmm. if you were using that from that example that you just said about, okay, so-and-so says no to your lunch invite. Like you can make it mean that you're a terrible person. Nobody wants to go to lunch with you or maybe Betty, whatever her name was. I forget what her name was. It was Betty. But whatever, <laughs> maybe Betty's going through something reason. difficult right now and I can go ask somebody else. Yeah, so. Exactly right. And you say too, like, you know, how, how this ties into the virtues too. 
especially, you know, I, I interpret the virtues the way St. Thomas Aquinas talks about them, but he's borrowing from all kinds of church fathers uh, before him. But one way to look at the, the, the moral virtues that guide our actions, the classic four key ones, the, the cardinal virtues of fortitude or courage, temperance or self-control, justice, you know, how you relate with others, and prudence or a practical wisdom. In a way, he said, they all involve bringing our emotions, like our wants, our desires, our, our moods, in line with right reason. Mm. Because prudence or practical wisdom is right reason applied to action. So in this sense, that conception of virtue is almost completely aligned with the goal of cognitive or rationally motive type therapies. You mm. want to bring your emotions in line with right reason, which means an accurate view of reality, an adaptive view of reality. Uh, so there's just so much confluence there. And I think it shows to the wisdom of the church. You know, I love the developments in cognitive therapy. They helped me even during the years I was an atheist before I came back to the church. But once I came back to the church, I'm kind of like, wow, <laughs> you know, we have put this all together. People like Thomas Aquinas have, and they actually did it centuries ago. So, so mm -hmm. all this wisdom is out there to help us. The, the modern psychological research and the ages old wisdom uh, of the church. So there's a lot to be thankful and optimistic about, you know, even if we're lonely. And I guess too, one of the fundamental lessons for, for Catholics if we're lonely is that we know if we embrace the theological virtue of hope, that we're gonna reside in heaven with God one day. He's gonna give us all the graces we need to get there. So mm -hmm. there's no way our loneliness is ever going to be eternal. This, this time of life is limited. And when we're in heaven, we're there with the grand, the communion of saints. So for any, you know, uh, uh, loving, devout Catholic person, loneliness could never be more than temporary. Mm -hmm. No, I love that. And I, I love also that you said that, that, that we need to, we need to apply reason to those situations of loneliness. And I think a lot of the time people think that they do lonely people that are kind of stuck in this cognitive distortion, they, they, they think that they are being reasonable. And the thought is, well, if I can avoid asking somebody else after Betty's rejected me, then I can avoid the hurt that is going to, or avoid another hurtful circumstance, right? Mm -hmm. And so it turns into something that's self-protective, which is, there's a perception that it's self-protective. But when we work with people and we really start to question, okay, like, what is the trajectory of this thought? What's the trajectory of of self-protection, this emotion of self-protection, or the action of not inviting other people out. Well, nobody goes out to lunch with you. You eat alone, you stay alone. Mm -hmm. And then you're there in that painful loneliness. But you've you've kind of created, created that your own, yeah, you've created your own circumstance at that point. Mm -hmm. That's true. It is, you know, like I say, what what do you what do you make this mean or situations like that? Yeah, you are showing them. The person, the lonely person does have more power than they, they think they do mm. to change their situation or, or to endure it if it doesn't change, uh, you know, right at, up front at the first part. So, yeah, absolutely, you know, powerful lessons there uh, uh, to, to get a person to reach out. And again, too, if they fail, another thing is uh, the lesson we get from the church is that certain periods of solitude can be very, very beneficial for mm. us. You know, we have examples of some saints who were, sol who were in periods of solitude by no choice of their own. The, mm -hmm. the ancient Catholic philosopher Boethius wrote a wonderful book on the Trinity. He was imprisoned before his death in the, the dying ages of the, the Roman uh, uh, Empire. St. Thomas More, you know, in the Tower of London for defying his former friend, uh, King Henry VIII. He wrote this wonderful book called The Sadness of Christ, where he even talked about Christ's loneliness, but it was precipitated by, by his involuntary confinement in that temple tower. Uh, St. Patrick of, of Ireland, uh, when he was captured by Irish pirates, he spent about six or seven years as a slave. And it was only during that time that he developed a relationship with God, even though his father was a deacon, he had a grandfather who was a, was a priest. But it was during that time where he was isolated that he developed that relationship with God and then he shared it to the world. And we have other saints, you know, the desert hermits, others who went out to various places in the wilderness on purpose, developed this deeper relationship with God. And then some of them came back into the world and shared all that. 
Other saints just even like, you know, Christ said, if you want to pray, go to your own room and shut the door. We have some great saints, St. Catherine of Siena, St. Rose of Lima, St. John of Avila, who were known for certain periods of their, their young adult lives to pretty much do that, spend most of their lives or a period of, of years in their room praying or a big portion of the day. Then they're coming out and they're able like dy dynamos. They're reaching out to others with those spiritual graces they accumulated during those years of, of solitude and prayer. It seems like kind of like one of those, those sayings, you know, like the only way to the other side to it is through it. I think I, from my own experience, like there have been times where I've worked at jobs. It's, it really is just solitude. I worked at Franciscan over the summer when I was a student there and I would just water trees by myself all day long. And I remember bringing my journal and praying and all like my prayer mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, I actually found such freedom from because I grew up in a big family, I was always around people. And I remember the summer being very pivotal for me because I, I, for so long, I thought being alone was bad. Mm -hmm. And, and this summer actually going through it, going through the loneliness, actually even choosing to go through it by taking this job that was like so, a very solitude type of job. Mm -hmm. I, um, I came out on the other side through God's grace, certainly by being like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not afraid of that. I'm not afraid of being alone. Like I love being alone now. Like I love, I look at it as solitude. I, I look at it as a beautiful thing. So um, similar to what you were saying. Yeah. It's almost like the only way to it is through it to that freedom is through it. And I have a question on this. So would somebody, so if somebody listening is saying to themselves, okay, so are you saying that it doesn't matter if I'm around other people at all? It's just, all I have to do is change my thoughts. Or like, is it, is the fact that like, it just doesn't matter if I'm not around anybody or is it like, or is that still an important part to have like the actual relationship that's here? Or can I just, that, that's an important question. I don't want to give a misrepresentation there. You know, even go back to the Stoics, you know, sometimes they're characterized as people who are just totally self-sufficient. They don't care about anything. It's all about their own virtue and, and this and that. But even the, some of the greatest Stoic writers said that even the Stoic sage who had mastered all of his emotions. You know, he might theoretically be self-sufficient, but he is going to prefer, he's going to want to have friends. He's mm -hmm. going to want to seek them out. So yes, we should. So the main lesson I think for solitude would be, uh, you know, that, well, one, a few, few lessons. Some people do have a lesser a need for companionship than others. You know, like the old introvert, extrovert, but even the introvert, we all need some connection. And I know like in some studies, like for young children, uh, their mental health of, of, of children, like school-aged children, the biggest difference in the world in terms of friends is going from zero to one. You know, that, mm -hmm. that one can make all the difference in the world. So we all do need some form of connection. So mm -hmm. the solitude message isn't going to be like, just decide, okay, I don't need other people. It's just you know, going to be me and God, just me and Jesus. I'll, I'll just work on my personal relationship with Jesus and ignore everybody else. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying that if certain circumstances in your life lead you to solitude, you, you might choose it for particular reasons or circumstances outside of your control to keep in mind that you can use that time even for the best of benefits. You know, there's a, the old problem of evil. Well, how can a God who's all good allow and all powerful allow there to be evil in the world? And the answer from St. Augustine and St. Aquinas and others is because God is so good and loving that he can bring good even from what appears to be evil. So I think, too, some of us, especially people who might go through a significant period of loneliness can come out, like, you know, uh, going through it, you know, coming out on the other side, stronger themselves, and also better able to reach out to others. So yeah, so the, the thing itself is, no, don't say forsake other people, say, if for reasons, you know, outside of my control or for a temporary time period, if I find myself more isolated, how can I make the most of that? And maybe even how can I build my relationship with God? learn things, study things. So when I can connect again, I'm going to have even more to share. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. A little bit. I have one, one more question on, we talked a little bit about CBT before mm -hmm. and to anyone who's listening, who doesn't know what that stands for. It's cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, a lot of what we do at Metanoia Catholic is kind of um, mirrored out of that, but we, we like to call it cognitive behavioral coaching versus therapy because mm -hmm. people hear the word therapy and they're like, ah, and we don't claim to be therapists. 
um, either. And so maybe if you could speak is, are the practices used in CBT only for sick people or for, are they for everyone? Everyone. Yeah. Everyone. <laughs> yes. Because I just thinking about this earlier with the CBT, it's kind of like, you know, well, you know, as Catholics, we're, you know, we need to take care of our bodies. Our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. We should take, try to take proper care of them. So it, it behooves us to learn some things about nutrition, to learn some things about different form of exercise, you know, so that we can properly care for our bodies. I think in a similar way, the methods of the cognitive uh, behavior therapy or coaching are kind of like, they're like instruments. They're like the techniques that we can use for proper cares of our, of our intellect, of our reason and of our emotion. So yes, they are, they're helpful for everyone. Uh, you know, whether you're a Catholic or not, whether you have mental issues you're battling with or, or not. Um, yeah, because it's just a guide to right thinking. And that's mm -hmm. the way too, they tie into virtues. So if you're, if the goal of cognitive therapy, one of the goals or cognitive coaching is that, that your attitudes, your moods, your actions are going to line up best with what's truly best for you, which what's truly best for your interactions with other people, then that's the same thing as building up uh, moral virtue. Mm. So yeah, I think the, the cognitive methods, I think are absolutely fantastic. Uh, the, the, there's a very great variety of them. They're, they're very common sense because they kind of, they, they grow out of common sense, just the way that we know our emotions and our minds work if we think very carefully about it and look about them very carefully. So yes, I love the concept of what you're doing with cognitive uh, behavioral coaching. And that's something too I had to do in this loneliness book is draw the line because, you know, am I talking about loneliness as a mental disorder? Well, there actually is no diagnosable code of loneliness as a mental disease, but many mental disorders will have loneliness as a component. So there's times we want to be careful. Like if we're so lonely, we realize, hey, I'm, I'm calling into work. I'm not going anymore, you know, or, or serious major things are going on or you become profoundly depressed. Then you want to, might want to reach out for some actual, uh, you know, therapy from a mental health professional. But there's going to be a vast number of people who don't get to that point, who are mm -hmm. still going to derive great benefit from, from coaching for people who've learned cognitive behavioral therapy or cognitive behavioral methods well. And then and some people from guided or reading also from digging into it more deeply, learning the principles of, yes, they're, they're very, very valid, helpful principles that, that can be used by virtually anyone. Yeah, I think, I, I think even just as a culture and Catholics having grown up in this culture, in this world, what I have found from my coaching that there's a lot of people out there that are afraid of emotions, afraid of the emotion or the sadness that they experience from this perception of not having emotional support, like loneliness. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I found that being extremely hopeful when I've helped, when I've kind of talked with clients about that, like the, the emotions are morally neutral. Our catechism says that. They, they, I mean, what, what actually qualifies them as moral is what actions they lead to. And if those are immoral or moral or whether or not they've passed through re your reason and your, your will, those are the two qualifiers that actually make an emotion moral. And so I think that's very hopeful to Catholics when they hear this, because I think a lot of people kind of run from loneliness and they go into these other type of numbing activities they're like ah, i can't handle that i can't handle that it's like well okay mm -hmm. but let's just look at it let's kind of break it down and so i think that's where the reason comes in thank you for clarifying that for me that's very hopeful as a coach who uses these tools and and saying like okay so i'm not i'm not acting as a therapist because i'm working with that huge group of people who are above baseline above baseline <laughs> yeah. like who can function and are not mentally ill right and and, and still can benefit yeah, from have these the full tools. faculties to be able to benefit from the tools yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely and there there's a you know parallel relationship between temptation and sin you know anyone can be tempted tempted in an instant by a variety of things but what makes a difference is how that's processed by the reason and the will mm. whether it turns into sinful behavior so so, so absolutely, these, these the parallels are, are really there. These cognitive methods are very, very, uh, can be very important to help us in a whole variety of ways. You know, whether you're like kind of, uh, you know, having any mental health issues or not. In fact, that's one of the things that drew, drew me so much to St. Thomas Aquinas is that, 
Uh, yes, he can give us very good advice if you're having problems, how to get back to baseline. But I think too, he's interested not so much in how low we can go in how high we can rise, you know, this is mm. development of virtue. And that's that we're all called to, even if we're you know, I'm functioning pretty well. Well, God can wants us to perfect ourselves as much as we can with his aid. And virtue and right thinking and these cognitive methods can be very, very helpful tools for anybody. So perfect ourselves with God's aid. And I think this kind of is a, a good way to come full circle with our conversation is we've been talking a lot about just the human faculties that we've got and our, our, our cognitive abilities and and uh, then you got this funny thing called grace mm -hmm. that kind of jumps into the mix. And it's very mysterious in the way that it works. It's like, okay, so where does my work start and where does it end? Where does God's work, God's grace start? And then, and is, is, there, ever, is there ever a place where we're operating without God's grace or is God's grace part of the entire process from start to finish? How does God's grace interact with this growth in virtue, uh, and particularly and perhaps even, even in an overcoming loneliness? Sure. And there's many, many ways you know, we can address this. One is even in terms of virtue. You know, we talk about the moral, like the cardinal virtues, prudence, uh, affordance, and, and uh, temperance and justice. There's intellectual virtues, science or knowledge, understanding and wisdom. But we also have the theological virtues that St. Paul tells us about faith, hope, and love. And in Catholic theology, these are infused in, into our souls from God. You know, at the moment of baptism, we, we're united to God with all these special graces that, that flow from them. And these include things like the gifts of the Holy Spirit. These seven gifts of the Holy Spirit perfect various virtues within us by allowing us to rely not only on our own right reason, but by special stirrings from the Holy Spirit himself, who is, who is never wrong, you know who knows all. So yeah, there, there are these ways of availing, us, of availing ourselves of God's graces. And that's, that's the most fundamental thing. You know, like even when I, uh, when I returned to the church after 25 years of being an atheist, I read something in an encyclical from Pope Leo XIII from 1879. He said, people who say they're going to follow, who've rejected the faith, say, I'm only going to follow reason, you know, like, or today you might say science, you know, what the evidence is going to point you to. He said, what's going to bring them back to the church? to the church and Christ are the stirrings of the Holy Spirit and the writings of the great uh, church fathers and scholastics and primarily St. Thomas Aquinas. Mm -hmm. Then like 125 years after he wrote that, that's exactly what happened to me. You know, so it was some grace there. There was some grace of God that's opening me up to reconsider this whole issue. And then also leading me through a series of events to then the rational arguments of St. Thomas Aquinas. So it's just all so deeply, deeply intertwined but, but yeah, the, the, the natural virtues we have are given to us by God on a natural level by the fact that he made us in his image and likeness as human beings. But he also offers us all these supernatural graces, which surpass the, those virtues and perfect them. You know, Thomas is, uh, says kind of it's like in three stages. He says we're given certain things by nature, like our capacity for, for memory. He says, but then art or diligence can perfect that nature you know like you practice things and get better at things he said mm -hmm. but even beyond that grace perfects the product of both of them so there's this this highest level coming from god himself that, that kind of puts the whole uh mm -hmm. picture together yeah yeah I'm, I'm in a divine mercy university spiritual direction certification program right now and we're just reading through that there's a, there's some point in our growth where we must decrease he must increase mm -hmm. where it goes from this active purgation mm -hmm. right uh with these acts of faith acts of virtue that we're yes. making to where um you enter into even that dark night right where it's not really clear what else we can do right and it's and at that point really we're, we're entering a much more contemplative a much more passive purgation, passive growth, growth, where, where, where God is really working in us in a very mysterious way. And that mystery is a place I can say is, is been uncomfortable for me, mm -hmm. right? And in, in coming to understand that because we like to have the control and we like to be goal driven and, and know that we're moving in the right direction. But there's still these mysterious ways that God's grace is working. Um, in ways that we can't even speak, we don't have the language to even share. Exactly. You know, and Thomas writes about levels of charity or God's love. And he says, you know, a first level, like 
you know, you realize, you know, God's there. I believe in you. I love you. So you're going to try to fight against sin. And you're hopefully you're making some progress there. And you're going to try to grow now in virtue. But he said, like the people who built the walls of Jerusalem, they're going to use one hand with their uh, tools to build the wall. The other hand, they're going to fight out their enemies. You're going to still fight the sin, right? But he said, ideally, yeah, we raise high enough. Even beyond this focus on virtue in our focus is on the union with God, that, that mystical union. And yeah, and there is a sense then now, instead of trying to do all these things, we're going to try to submit to God, like, kind of like with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You know, We're going to submit to the stirrings there. And that can bring us surprises. And we may not always get an emotional high out of that. It can bring dark nights. It can, can lead, uh, you know, periods of concern. But, but it's a beautiful thing when we uh, ideally, or at least at times, can reach that level of just a greater trust uh, in God, which virtually, well, for every saint, you know, has reached that, that level and in, in the various ways can give us an example, some guidance, how, how we might pattern that in our own lives. Mm. Yeah. You just got to start reading them. Yeah. Start I want, reading about I want them. to ask this final question. Um, where does grace, virtue, and CBT, all the things that we've talked about, collide? All right. Very good. We're, okay. Grace, virtue, and uh, CBT. And I'll take it as like three steps up the ladder. Uh, CBT is just on the, the ladder of human nature, how God crafted us with intellects and wills. We choose what we want to do. We know the difference between right and wrong. We're not like the animals that just operate by instinct. We're not like the angels that know what they know instantly. We have to work through these processes. Mm. We don't automatically get things right in our thinking. And CBT, boy, it, it helps us get there. It shows us how to think clearly about things that that matter in our life, like how we control our, our emotions and, and desires uh, uh, and so on. And then kind of that, that second step up of the, the ladder there is, is uh, virtue. And at the natural level, it, it shares the same thing that CBT does. Every single human being made an image like this God, we all, all have access to this. We're all called to grow in natural virtue, like the cardinal virtues and the virtues that perfect our mind. So it's very, very uh, concomitant with cognitive therapy, cognitive methods, but sometimes cognitive methods, even like in the, the therapy through psychologists, will be that we're going to try to eliminate your distress. So now you go from down below normal. Okay, now you're at normal. But virtue is also about going from normal to how high can we rise. So virtue is that right thinking. And for Christians and Catholics, it's based on our faith. We know we have higher goals that God has laid down for us. But then the highest of all is that realm of grace. And this is where God is we're allowing God to directly act within our souls through those theological virtues, through various graces, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So this is what, you know, absolutely puts everything together. And it's only that the highest level of grace that will also bring us uh, to God in heaven one day. But the graces, you know, and the virtues are also tools that we use through God's grace, you know, to get there. Wow. That was very succinct. Oh, it was awesome. That was very helpful. I was like building a diagram in my head. Yep. Like, this is helpful. This is so helpful. We might steal that. Yeah. <laughs> Please do, because chances oh, are I took it from sources. an earlier Thomist. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Kevin, thank you so much for coming on. I know this has been, well, it's been incredibly helpful for, for me. I can only speak for myself. Oh, certainly. Yeah. Um, but I know this is going to be so helpful for our listeners to hear this. And, and we really hope that you come back. Because yeah. we're going to keep inviting you to come back. Oh, wonderful. I love to. I've really enjoyed this. You guys have wonderful insights. So it's been a joy delving into these topics. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kevin. Yeah. So everyone check out um, Dr. Kevin Vos. Check out all of his books. Um, one Minute Aquinas. We're reading yes. that one right now. The, the Unearthing Your Ten Talents is one that I've been reading a little bit every single day. And uh, there's a lot of good nuggets on there to, to meditate upon. That's a great one. If you're just looking to have a better understanding, increase your, vo uh, your vocabulary mm -hmm. on the virtues. Um, and the one that we discussed today is the Catholic guide to loneliness, which yeah. I, I've recommended it to so many people so far. <laughs> um, a, a lot of my clients, but I, I highly recommend it. Um, how can people find you? Well, my website is drvost.com, just D-R-V-O-S-T.com. And at the very bottom, there is a comment box. If anybody has a question or comment for me, send it on and I will respond. 
All right. Great. We thank look you forward so to much. more books. Yes. Thank All you right. so much. All right. Have thank a wonderful you. day. Thanks. God bless. God bless.